Okay, well, welcome to the first Cancer Prevention and uh, Management Special Interest Group webinar. Um, my name is Christina Carbonen, and together with Erica James, we're going to be moderating this session. Um, I'm going to start by giving uh, just a very brief introduction to the webinars in, in general and um, to do some housekeeping. So, um, as ISBNPA, uh, we're delighted that we can organize these webinars um, as an extra service for our members. Uh, today's webinar is organized by the Cancer Prevention and Management Special Interest Group. Uh, you can see a full list and details of all of our special interest groups and how to join them on the ISBNPA website. Throughout the months of February and March, uh, we will be offering a number of other free webinars by other special interest groups through ISBNPA. Uh, you can find more information about these webinars and how to attend, attend them on the website. Um, we also have recordings of past ISBNPA webinars that are available um, also through the website. All right, so now I'm going to talk to you briefly about how the webinar is going to proceed today. Um, the program uh, we are using is Zoom, uh, and in this system you are all muted except for the speaker and the organizers, and this just prevents noise and keeps us concentrated on the actual talk. Um, however, we would like to give you a chance to interact with us and ask questions and make comments, so we ask that you please compose questions as we go along through the presentation. Uh, the organizers are going to then at the end of the presentation aggregate some of these comments and ask questions on behalf of the audience. Um, you're also going to note that there's a full screen mode and if you click on this icon you will be, enter that mode and from our experience we find that this is um, a better way to be able to enjoy the webinar. So now we'll get started on this webinar um, which is being presented by Dr. Renata Winkles who is at Penn State Cancer Institute in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Okay, so I can give it over to you, to Renata. Yep, thank you. So now everybody should be able to see my screen. Um, well, I would like to start with thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be invited to present this webinar. Um, and um, uh, it's the first time that I ever do a webinar. Um, so um, I fully understand that I'm competing here with email and Netflix and other distractions. Um, so I hope to make it as um, entertaining as uh, possible. I'll do my best for that. So my goal for the next 45 to 50 minutes is to provide you with an overview of the emerging importance of body composition for um, colorectal cancer um, uh, patients during treatment and throughout their survivorship. And um, I've um, included this outline, I will include it throughout the presentation that if somehow you would get distracted by something else, um, you will get back um, online. Um, uh, you can get, get back on track with this outline. Um, so I divide my um, presentation into four um, parts. In the first part, I will briefly update you on uh, studies on the role of BMI in colorectal cancer survivor. Then I will continue with the role of body composition in colorectal cancer survival. Um, after that, I will proceed with a part on the role of body composition in cancer treatment. So that will be more focused on shorter term outcomes to so surgical outcomes and chemotherapy completion rates. And, in the, and all those three first parts will mainly be observational data that I will be presenting there. And in the last part of the webinar, I will uh, discuss a couple of intervention studies that are currently ongoing on um, intervention studies on body composition. Um, and during the whole presentation, I will focus on early stage colorectal cancer, so stage one, two, and three. So that means no metastasized cancer. Um, and that is because um, cachexia and muscle wasting are very highly prevalent among uh, late stage disease. Um, and then the question really is whether muscle wasting is uh, impacting survival or whether um, the wasting is really a sign of people dying, so really a result of the disease. So as, since I didn't want to focus on cachexia, but really on early stage colorectal cancer, I decided that that will be the focus of my webinar. 
Um, and um, I, focus, I will focus on colorectal uh, cancer, which is the combination of colon or rectum cancer. Um, since body fatness is such an important risk factor for that cancer, so in the prevention, it's really important. Um, and um, because CT scans are readily available for most of these patients, I decided to focus on them too. And I will come back to, you, uh, to that later of why that is so important. So the first part, um, BMI and colorectal cancer survival. Um, so this will not be... This will not be any news for you that there are many cancers that are associated with overweight and obesity, uh, colon and rectal cancer being one of them. So being overweight or obese uh, increases your risk of getting these types of cancers. Now, does it also mean that being overweight or obese decreases your risk of, uh, of, of uh, surviving this disease? Um, well, that whether that is true is... Um, um, is less um, known, um, and um, there are a couple of publications now that suggest that there could be an obesity paradox in colorectal cancer survival, um, meaning that obesity, although it's associated with an increased risk of getting cancer, being obese or overweight is actually protective in colorectal cancer survival. So in this graph, you can see that the people with the lowest um, risk of dying uh, from colorectal cancer are actually probably in a category of between a BMI of uh, 25 or 30, um, or maybe even a little bit higher. So that is in the overweight or obese category. Um, and there are a couple of publications that, that, that provide explanations of what, what could be the role for this obesity paradox. Um, and they more or less focus on three types of, of explanations. The first is that there could be physiological explanations, um, so, which means that, well, they think maybe patient, patients who are a little bit overweight or obese have more physiological reserves um, to cope with the disease. There are more um, um, selection type of explanations so that the selection of the patients um, in a survival cohort will lead to these uh, um, associations so that the associations are actually not true, but the result of selection. Um, and there are some methodological um, explanations. Um, and I would like to really focus on this last possible explanation first and explain that a little bit more. Um, because one of the methodological explanations is that BMI may not be the best parameter to study in this aspect. It may not be, um, um, when you look into BMI, obviously these two guys on the bottom, will, they will have the same BMI, but they obviously do not have the same body composition. And maybe, maybe one is more important than the other, or their combination is more important than body weight. Um, and um, so I would like to continue with my talk with um, explaining a little bit more what we know about body composition and colorectal cancer survival. Um, and that is where the CT scans come into play. Um, and um, uh, why this is so important is, well, the CT scans obviously are there um, because people were diagnosed with cancer. So the CT scans are made to see where the tumor is actually located. Um, uh, um, but what is really nice about CT scans is that you can also use these scans to capture information on body composition. Um, and um, so this is a CT scan that you see on the uh, level of the third lumbar vertebra. So in the skeleton uh, that you see on the right, this is at the third red, um, the level of the third red vertebra. Um, so what you see on the CT scan is it in the middle is the vertebra and you see the two kidneys, you see the intestines. Um, and you can um, capture several uh, things from this CT scan. Um, what you can see is the visceral fat. So that is the yellow fat that is surrounding the organs. Um, you can see how much muscle somebody has, um, which is the red. You can see uh, the subcutaneous adipose tissue that somebody has, which is the teal color um, tissue. And you can see the intermuscular adipose tissue, which, is the, which are the small green spots. Um, and um, 
what other researchers have shown that although this is only one CT scan at the level of the L3, this one, uh, the, the areas of skeletal muscle that you will see at this CT scan really correlate really well with total body volumes of skeletal muscle and of adipose tissue values. So it's one scan, but it's really a good uh, representation of total um, body skeletal mass and total body adipose tissue uh, levels. <clears throat> um, so since these uh, patients ha all have CT scans, you now have the opportunity to not only look into body weight and survival, but to look into body composition and survival. So what, these what the group of Betty Kahn in, um, um, in Oakland Permanente did was do a big retrospective study where they, um, um, where they collected the CT scans from the medical records of about 3,000 patients. Um, and did this analysis of body composition and then follow up, followed up with these patients over time and assessed um, um, the death rate of these people. Um, so they did this analysis in about 3,000 people. Um, and um, I've shown some brief characteristics of the population here. About one third of that population had a normal BMI, about one third was overweight, and then about one third was obese, and about 40% of the patients was classified as low muscle. Um, and that was done with what um, um, with an area under the curve ROC, ROC analysis to see what was the best cutoff points for low muscle. <clears throat> um, in this uh, study, they created um, four groups, people with a normal body composition, so they had a normal muscle mass, a normal adiposity level, people with a low muscle mass, um, people with a, um, and with a normal adiposity level, people with a high adiposity uh, level, but with a normal muscle mass, and people with a combination of both, so both low muscle and high adiposity. And in this uh, study, they showed that all those three groups had a higher um, a risk of mortality compared to the people in the normal body composition group with a slightly higher um, risk in the people who had both a low muscle mass and a high adiposity uh, level. Um, they also looked into the association with BMI and what they showed here was pretty similar to what I've showed you in a previous um, slide that people in the overweight group, so with a BMI between 25 and 30, that they had the lowest risk of um, dying from colorectal cancer. Um, but more interestingly, they looked into the body composition of these, um, uh, of these participants. Um, um, so I now show you um, in this slide what the body composition is of the patients in the different BMI groups. So again, they have four groups, people with a normal muscle mass, normal adiposity level, people with a low muscle mass and a normal adiposity level, people with a high adiposity um, and normal muscle mass, and people with a low muscle and a high adiposity. Um, and what you see is um, you, do the participants see my mouse? Erica, can you not? Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, um, what you see is in this group between 20 and 25, that there is a large group um, of people that have low muscle. And actually in this group between 25 and 30, there is actually a much bigger group of people with a normal mus muscle mass. So the explanation for the graph that I show above here is not maybe not that being overweight or obese is associated um, uh, with better survival, but really that there is a high prevalence of low muscle among people with a normal BMI group and that that may be driving the association um, with mortality. Um, so with that being said, uh, um, uh, body composition is probably partly explaining the obesity paradox that you see in colorectal cancer. Um, so an additional thing that you can learn from CT scan is something about, well, what some people call the muscle quality. Um, and it's actually more the fat infiltration in the muscle. Um, so a CT scan is actually a type of x-ray and um, the um, um, 
the tissues attenuate the x-rays and depending on the attenuation you can distinguish between different types um, of tissue um, and um, uh, so um, what you can see um, is that water has an Hounsfield unit of zero, fat has a little bit lower um, uh, uh, Hounsfield unit, and air uh, has a, um, a Hounsfield unit of minus thousand, um, which means that it, it that it hardly attenuates the X-rays at all. Um, so for uh, muscle, what they defined is that usually muscle has an Hounsfield unit that ranges between minus 21 and plus 150. And now depending on the amount of muscle or of fat that you have in the muscle, um, uh, the range of Hounsfield units that you'll find for that muscle may be a little bit lower or a little bit higher. So here you see two uh, pictures. Above you see a picture of a person with a, um, a normal uh, muscle and below you'll see a person um, that has a lot of fat in the muscle um, and what you see uh, there is that the spectrum um, uh, of Hounsfield unit that you'll find for the for the person below is really different than the spectrum you see above so the so every pixel every uh, every um, pixel that is colored as muscle the average Hounsfield unit of that is assessed and then overall, you can you can you can calculate what the average density or the average Hounsfield unit is of muscle. Um, and the more fat there is in your muscle, the lower the Hounsfield unit is. So um, people also call this muscle density, and mus muscle density really re is reflective of the amount of fat in the muscle. Um, now, there are a couple of things that we know of what, what affects the muscle density, uh, and one of them is the use of contrast fluid for CT scans. Um, that can, um, well, that can a little bit affect the density that you'll find. So if contrast fluid are, is used for CT scan, you'll find a muscle density that is a little bit higher than if it is a CT scan without contrast fluid. H, oh, there is a, a helicopter passing by here. I hope that people can still hear me. I think so far it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so age is a factor that is um, um, affecting muscle density with higher age having a lower um, muscle density, more adipose tissue. So more fat overall is associated with a little bit higher uh, muscle density. And um, there are some studies that suggest that resistance and aerobic exercise will also have an effect on the muscle density. But does it also affect um, survival? Um, we were interested, interested to find that out. Um, and we worked, or we are working on that um, in, a, um, in a project that is a collaboration between Wageningen University, the Netherlands Cancer Registry, and Maastricht University. And Wageningen University is the university where I worked before coming to Penn State, um, and I continue to collaborate on this grant. Um, and I definitely wanted to show a picture from uh, Harm van Baar, as he is the PhD student on the project, and he did all the work. So I really want to acknowledge him there. Um, <clears throat> so in our study, we wanted to assess what is the role of muscle mass, but more importantly, muscle density for colorectal cancer survival. Um, so in a group of about 1,600 early stage colorectal cancer patients um, who were diagnosed with colorectal cancer in one of 11 hospitals in the, in the Netherlands in between 2006 and 2015, um, we, we um, collected the CT scan from the medical records. So these were all pre-surgery CT scans and followed these people up over time. Um, and in our population, we found that about 40% had a normal BMI, about 43% um, was overweight, and about 30%, or sorry, 17% um, was obese. So the obesity rates are a little bit lower um, than in the previous study that I showed um, from Betty Kahn's group. Um, in our study, we also defined our own cutoff levels uh, for muscle, since we weren't sure that the cutoff levels that were defined in a population with different obesity rates would be valid for our population. 
um, uh, we decided to use our own cutoff levels using the same methodology as um, the other studies did. We found that about 38% of the people had a low muscle mass and about 41% of the people had a low muscle density. Um, so when we looked into muscle mass, we found that people with a low muscle mass had a slightly higher risk of dying from colorectal cancer over time, but this was not statistically significant. But um, muscle density clearly was. Uh, so people with a low muscle density had a substantially higher risk of dying from the disease, and we adjusted for all kinds of things um, here. Um, and um, we have submitted these data for um, publication. Um, we also looked into the combination of both things. Um, so uh, uh, we also created four groups there, people with a normal muscle mass and a normal density, people with only a low density but normal muscle mass, people with a low muscle mass and a normal density, and a combination of people with a low density and low muscle mass. And in that combined analysis, we found that really the people who had low density were the people with an elevated risk of dying, but not really people with a low muscle mass. So we really we couldn't really confirm the findings of low muscle mass in our um, cohort. Um, so to conclude on those um, uh, studies, BMI certainly doesn't tell the whole story um, and it's probably not sensitive enough um, to differentiate between, um, uh, or is certainly not um, sensitive enough to differentiate between muscle and fat. Um, and uh, muscle mass and muscle density both seem to be associated with survival, but the data so far are not really fully consistent across the studies. Um, and a potential reason for that is that all studies so far, as I explained, use their own cutoff points. Whether that is really appropriate or not, um, that is a point of discussion. Um, so there is ongoing discussions whether there should be um, uh, standardized cutoff points based on uh, age or based on gender, ethnicity, or other things. Um, and um, um, there's also variation in studies um, uh, in, in the statistical methods used, it, especially in the multivariate models that were used. Um, so for our study and the study that I showed, the statistics were pretty similar, but some of the other studies that were done so far really used more prediction modeling, and that is really different and can result in different findings. Um, <clears throat> so from that, I want to continue with the third part of my talk, which is really focused on more um, uh, earlier um, outcomes of uh, after colorectal cancer diagnosis, so um, on the role of body composition for surgical outcomes and the role of body composition during chemotherapy. Um, so when you look into surgical outcomes, um, there are several factors that are traditionally associated, have been associated um, with um, um, complication rates after surgery or other uh, uh, things that could be seen as surgical outcomes. So obviously age is a pretty important factor, clinical factor, clinical factors, so such as the stage of disease is something that will have an effect or will predict what the outcome of surgery, surgery will be. Um, the American Society of Anesthesiology um, classification is more a classification of physical status, but that is really a broad classification. Um, and um, in literature, people have suggested that body composition may really help to predict much better what the outcomes of surgery will be. So to help inform physicians on what the best treatments should be for, this, for, for certain patients. Um, so again, this was, this was assessed now in, in studies where they again um, used the CT scan to gather this information on body composition. So this is just an example of one study where they did that. There's multiple other uh, studies that, that um, assess this also. So this is a study from Canada where they assessed in, where they collected the information in 234 colorectal cancer patients with stage two, three, and four colorectal cancer. So not only early stage, 33% of the population here was metastatic. Um, 
and they divided people into being sarcopenic or not. And with sarcopenia, they meant here um, having a low muscle mass or not, or, or not having a low muscle mass based on the CT scans. Um, and what they showed here is um, that the infection rates were a little bit higher for people with sarcopenia versus uh, people not having sarcopenia. That people who needed in inpatient rehabilitation, that that was more prevalent among people who were sarcopenic. Um, and that also that length of stay was a little bit higher for people um, who had low muscle mass. And this was, um, this was seen both in the total population and when a stratified population where they only looked at patients with a, an age above 65. Now, obviously, these tables are only uh, uh, numbers. They also did an uh, adjusted analysis um, where they showed that the adjusted odds ratio for infection for uh, sarcopenic versus non-sarcopenic patients with 4.6, so one in four times higher risk of getting an infection. And um, for rehabilitation care, the need for rehabilitation care, inpatient rehabilitation care, also there, the sarcopenic patients had a much higher risk of needing such care. Um, <clears throat> so muscle, muscle mass and other um, uh, studies suggested also potentially fat mass uh, could be important concept for risk stratification and assessment for colorectal surgery. Um, and um, the reference I included here is an excellent overview or an excellent review that reviews all the studies so far. Um, um, but a note um, it here is that um, pro prognostic or prediction modeling is usually the technique that is used here to assess whether there are, um, whether muscle mass is predictive of a better or worse outcome. Um, and that is really different than etiological modeling, um, where you would, um, so in prediction modeling, the goal is really to get the best model to predict a certain outcome. In etiological modeling, you're much more wanting to understand a certain association and you want to adjust for compounding and, and um, assess effect modification in the best possible possible way. So also for the for chemotherapy, body composition may be uh, pretty important. Um, <clears throat> um, and that is because um, a lot of the uh, chemotherapy drugs that are used are either hydrophilic or lipophilic, um, which means that their volume of distribution really depends on the body composition. Um, however, the dose of chemotherapy is usually assessed based on the body surface area of a person. And this is the, uh, what I show you here on the screen is the, um, uh, the formula on how to collect body surface area, and that only takes into account height or weight. Um, so it doesn't take into account what the body composition is of people. Um, so um, um, you may either over or underdose people when you don't take that body composition of people into account. Um, and um, why that is important is when you potentially overdose people, people may experience a lot of side effects of chemotherapy and that may then lead to dose delays or dose reductions or uh, to an early stoppage of chemotherapy. So dose delay means that when you're scheduled to get your chemotherapy, your second um, infusion of chemotherapy next week, that that is delayed with two or with three weeks um, to make sure that you'll have more time to recover um, to cope with your next uh, infusion of chemotherapy. And any deviations from the planned dose or from the planned time schedule may affect um, the recurrence or survival rates. Um, so you really want to try to stick to the planned uh, schedule of chemotherapy. Um, and the other way around is also true. If you're underdosing people, people may not get the um, effective dose that they, um, that they actually need. Um, so again, we assess this in a retrospective study um, where we collected the CT scans from the um, medical records of about 150 colon cancer patients who were treated with KPOX, which is the combination of capacitabine and oxaliplatin. Um, 
and we assessed chemotherapy completion rates from medical records um, and assessed whether body composition was associated with, it, with these um, uh, chemotherapy data. Um, so we uh, collected information of about 150 people, 15 people um, with well, similar BMI distribution of uh, what I, as what I showed previously, and about 35% of these people had low uh, skeletal muscle, uh, low skeletal muscle mass. <clears throat> um, about 90% of the patients um, experienced any any adjustments in relative dosage of chemotherapy throughout their whole chemotherapy. Um, um, trajectory. So it means um, that they either had an early stoppage or postponement of treatment, um, a reduction, or that the patient was hospitalized. Um, so that was um, pretty high. Um, so because of that, we did our analysis in two ways. We took all the adjustments in chemotherapy into account, and we looked into only the first cycle of chemotherapy. Um, to see what was happening uh, there. Um, but it actually didn't matter. We didn't find any associations between muscle mass and relative dose adjustments during that or after that first cycle of chemotherapy or any associations between muscle mass and um, any uh, adjustment during uh, chemotherapy during all the cycles of chemotherapy. Um, so this was in the continuous analysis, what I'm showing here. But we also tried very, uh, various other ways of looking at it, um, assessing it in turtles, uh, making groups. But no, no, it just we didn't find any associations. Um, so in our study, muscle mass was not really associated with any um, uh, changes in chemotherapy schedule. Um, but there are several other studies that do show associations, and this is one of the largest studies that assess this so far. Um, again, from the same group um, that I showed previously. Um, what here they assessed in 533 colon cancer patients who were all treated with Falvox, which is a combination of 5-FU, leucophorin, and oxaliplatin. And they again assessed, uh, looked at the CT scans at diagnosis. So they divided the people into turtiles of muscle. So they had a low uh, middle group of muscle and a high um, uh, turtile of, um, of muscle. muscle. Um, and um, um, then they assessed in these, uh, in these turtiles what the risk was of, um, of early stoppage of chemotherapy, a delay of chemotherapy of a dose reduction of chemotherapy. And they showed here that the blue group, so that is the group with low muscle, that they had the highest odds ratio, so the highest risk of an early stoppage, a delay of a do or a dose reduction um, in chemotherapy. And this was for the 5-FU part of Folfox. Um, they also did the same analysis for the oxaliplatin um, part of the drug, and the results that they found for that were pretty similar. Um, so this study really showed clear associations um, with uh, um, between muscle mass um, and uh, changes in chemotherapy uh, treatments, um, and um, so it was not really it was different than what we found, but pretty clear in this uh, study. Um, so uh, what we can conclude from this is that body composition um, seems to be associated with surgical and chemotherapy outcomes, although the data are not fully consistent over all the studies. Um, and um, some of the reasons for that could be that, again, studies use different cutoff points, so there's not really any standardization there. And also, again, uh, different studies use different statistics and different modeling techniques. Um, in the studies on surgical outcomes, there's a lot of variation in what the exact outcome is that people actually look at. Um, so you can look at um, infection rates, length of stay in the hospital, certain biomarkers in blood, uh, anastomic leakages, all kinds of things here. 
and um, different studies report very different outcomes, which make which makes it really hard to um, to quantitatively summarize the findings of those studies. And actually, for chemotherapy. Um, um, the story may be even more complicated because there are so many things that you can look at um, if when you look into uh, chemotherapy completion rates you can look at the dose and the timing and whether there were any difference in that but you can also look into the toxicity profiles whether people experienced more nausea or less nausea or other side effects you can look at platelets count neutrophils all kinds of other things and um, and again different studies report on different things which makes it really hard to um, to combine and, and to give a really definite answer of what do we see um, and um, uh, what is really important there is that it's also really hard to find out what the exact plan schedule was of chemotherapy um, and sometimes um, a medic may um, may decide to already start with a lower uh, planned schedule of chemotherapy than uh, what was calculated based on body service area and how how do you take that into account and how do you find that out from the medical records um, <clears throat> another aspect that complicates the um, uh, co um, uh, summarizing the evidence is that obviously obesity rates vary a lot between populations um, and um, um, and also stages of disease. Some studies included late stage disease, others did not. Um, and also type of cancer may be very important um, here and not all studies. Some studies just had a mixed uh, population of different cancers. And obviously these are all observational studies. So you try to adjust for all kinds of things, but there's always the possibility of residual findings for things that you didn't know of or for things that you couldn't capture or you couldn't control for. <clears throat> um, so sometimes the only thing you can do is, um, or if you really want to have good evidence for something, you need to do an intervention study. You cannot rely only on observational studies. So that, this brings me to the last part of my talk, um, which is focused on intervention studies. <clears throat> so based on the findings so far, um, Intervention studies on body composition um, um, assess whether chemotherapy should be based on body composition, and those are really um, those are studies which are really hard to do, um, um, and um, re you really need the collaboration of um, of the pharma companies there to do those uh, studies. So there are a couple of studies ongoing there, but I don't know if that will really ever result in, in, the, in a difference in how um, the chemotherapy is subscribed to patients. Something else that is getting more and more attention, especially in the surgical um, uh, um, uh, field, is prehabilitation studies, which is really um, interventions that start before people had surgery. So see if you can improve muscle mass before people ever even undergo any treatment for chemotherapy. <clears throat> um, and the last thing is um, intervention studies that focus on whether maintaining or improving muscle mass will help to cope with chemotherapy. And um, here at Penn State, I have the opportunity to work on a trial that is exactly studying that last uh, point. So the role of muscle mass for people who are undergoing chemotherapy um, and the study that I have the fortunate to work on is called the FOR study and FOR stands for focus on reducing dose limiting toxicities in colon cancer with resistance to exercise. It's um, an R1 funded study, so funded by the NCI um, and it's a 3PI study uh, with Dr. Betty Kahn, Dr. Jeffrey Meyerhart and Dr. Catherine Smith. Um, and um, the rationale for that study really is that low muscle mass is so highly prevalent among colon cancer patients, and there are several studies that suggest that uh, low muscle mass could be associated with a higher risk of any adjustments in chemotherapy. Um, and we know that resistance exercise can really help to increase muscle mass. 
um, potentially this increase could help to affect the risk of relative dose adjustments. Um, so the aim of the force uh, study is to examine whether a resistance exercise intervention during the period of chemotherapy will result in differences in dose reductions, in dose delays, and in early stoppage for chemotherapy, and in the total combined number of moderate and severe chemotherapy-associated toxicities, um, so in the intervention compared to a waitlist control group. <clears throat> and then um, as a secondary aim, we want to assess what is happening to inflammation and inflammatory markers in relation to muscle mass and fat mass and examine um, uh, changes in inflammatory markers over time between intervention and control group. So to see whether the effect is really um, um, driven by uh, muscle mass and inflammation. Um, and in a subgroup, there will be a more detailed assessment of how um, body composition changes affect the pharmacokinetics of uh, 5-FU and oxaliplatin, which is the drug, the combination of drugs that is mostly used for this, um, for this um, uh, group. Um, so the, the trial will be a randomized controlled trial um, with 180 uh, patients. Uh, colon cancer patients, stage two and three, who all obviously need to be undergoing chemotherapy, and the intervention will be a resistance exercise intervention in combination with a protein supplementation in compare, um, compared with a weightless control group. Um, so during the, page, during the period of chemotherapy, um, um, patients will either be undergoing a resistance exercise group, which will be um, um, largely home-based, but will be supervised by an exercise trainer, um, and people will be subscribed to, or people will be getting a protein supplement to make sure that the protein intake is sufficient to enable um, uh, muscle hypertrophy. And if you want to know more about the trial, this is the um, uh, clinicaltrials.gov identifier. So we have just gotten um, IRB approval for the trial, so we'll hope to re start recruitment in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> um, so there's promising data on muscle mass and chemotherapy completion rate, but data are certainly not consistent um, and trials are needed um, to confirm uh, these findings and to show that intervening on muscle mass really helps. Um, and something that is gaining more and more experience is, well, the, the type of trials that we do here during chemotherapy, but also trials that start even earlier before any treatment, which is called prehabilitation research. Um, so to conclude my talk, um, I hope that I convinced you that BMI uh, certainly will not uh, tell the whole story, um, and that muscle mass and muscle density are emerging as important factors for survival. Um, but that standardization of uh, um, how to assess uh, muscle mass is urgently needed to make firmer conclusions and to uh, summarize the evidence. Um, that observational data suggests that muscle mass has an important role during treatment and that the future will tell us whether intervening on muscle mass will impact chemotherapy completion rates uh, or outcomes in colon cancer patients. Um, and um, as a last slide, I really want to um, 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 acknowledge two groups, which is my previous group in the Netherlands, Wageningen University, and all the other groups that I worked with there, and my group here at Penn State, and, um, and the whole new network that is opening up for me um, here. And I decided to include this on a map that is upside down. Um, since I'm now here in Hershey for about a year, and one of the reasons for going abroad was really that I wanted to broaden my perspective on research and, um, and get out of my comfort zone, turn my world upside down, and that's really happening. I'm learning a lot about a new research environment, um, and, um, um, and, and I'm really thankful for that oppor opportunity. So um, I want to really thank both groups um, for, for this opportunity. Um, and that's how I wanted to end my talk and open it up for discussions. And I've included my email address here. So if people want to um, follow up with me via email, please do so. 
Thanks very much, Renata, for a fabulous presentation. Um, my name's Erica James, and I'm, uh, I'm currently in Australia, so it's lovely to see um, myself up on the top of the map. For um, It's a very unusual situation. So I'm going to um, moderate some questions. And the first one is um, a little more of a comment, I think, from Anna Campbell, who's um, commented that the FORCE trial um, is also looking at immune system changes. And I wondered if you had any comment um, in relation to the importance of that in regards to what you've been speaking about today, Renata. Um, let me think that I really understand the question. So what the importance is of changes in the immune system through changes in body composition? I think so. Mm -hmm. Um, let me see if I have a really specific comment. I certainly do think that there, I mean, I'm, I'm singling out body composition obviously now, but it's not body composition and muscle mass really have an effect on all kinds of things. And um, so I definitely think that the role of, 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 of muscle and the myokines that they excrete and um, um, the effect that that may have on the immune system may be um, really really important but i don't know if i would have any more specific comments there so you've given us a really um convincing argument about um some of the limitations of simply managing bmi so mm -hmm. renata what would your comment be about um you know many of the existing um, longitudinal cohort studies that either rely entirely on self-report or um, don't have access to medical records. Is there still some benefit in collecting BMI or should we really be pushing um, those, you know, longitudinal cohorts and other observational studies to move beyond um, simply reporting BMI for this mm -hmm. particular um, clinical group? Well, I think if you... If you if you have an opportunity to collect more than just BMI, then I would certainly do so. But um, um, I mean, in in a especially in a cohort which is not in a disease, then you then you wouldn't have any CT scans, and you wouldn't ask healthy per persons to go and have a CT scan just for the reason of getting more information on body composition because it is an x-ray so there is radiation involved um, uh, there um, and there's obviously ways of getting a little bit more information about um, about the amount of um, abdominal fat by measuring waist circumference hip circumference um, you can you can um, have blood samples to get a better idea of certain bio biomarkers which may be also more important uh, um, um, so if you, if you can get more information on body composition, I would certainly do so. Um, but I fully understand that that is not always possible and very often really expensive to collect. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just ask one final question and then I might um, hand over and see if um, Annie Anderson, who's the um, lead for our special interest group, has any um, particular questions or comments that she would like to add. Um, so, Renata, if you were giving advice to an early career researcher um, who was interested in um, this area, what specific areas or, um, you know, key focus points would you um, suggest to an early career researcher as the most important next steps in um, this space in terms of body composition and colorectal cancer? Um, um, well, some of the things that I mentioned during my talk, I think there is the field would really benefit if there was a little bit more standardization um, across studies in how cutoffs for low muscle mass um, are assessed and also in the verbiage that is used to, um, uh, um, to talk about uh, low muscle mass. So there is the term sarcopenia is there, myopenia, um, uh, dynopenia. Um, there are so many... Um, uh, uh, terms and there's not and a lot of these terms are not really well defined um, which which has the result that everybody is using sometimes the same term for different things um, or, the, or the other way around they're using different terms but they all mean the same um, so I think that is something um, that need much needs much more uh, attention um, and um, I 
Well, I think also in some areas, intervention studies, prehabilitation studies are really promising. Um, intervention during intervention studies during chemotherapy, and something that I didn't uh, mention during my talk is well, so I have a PhD in nutrition. Mm. Um, and this really focused on body composition. I didn't talk about nutrition here. Um, um, but I think it's pretty obvious that um, um, physical activity can really, or a resistance exercise can really affect body composition. But obviously, nutrition will also have a role there. So it may be uh, the most simple thing is to look into uh, protein. But there may be other things to, that you can think about on how nutrition and physical activity can work together to optimize body composition. So I think that is also a really interesting field of so if I can um, reassure any participants, if you um, have any questions, we still do have some time and you're welcome to post those um, in the Q&A or via the chat. Um, but I might pass over to um, Annie Anderson and see if she has any um, particular questions or um, things that she'd like to raise. Annie? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renate. It was a, a wonderful talk. I am also a nutritionist, um, but my area is really dietary interventions. And so body composition, I only have a really fleeting knowledge about. Um, but I do, I am interested in the force intervention. Um, and one of the things I wanted to ask was about the resistance training in terms of um, what the dose is, um, its suitability for frail patients and your eligibility criteria for that. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, I will start with um, uh, disclosing that I came to one of my reasons to uh, come to, to join Katie Schmidt's group here was to really learn about exercise interventions in cancer patients. Since my, my, my background is in body composition and nutrition and not really in physical activity and exercise. So that is what I'm learning now here. Um, so I'll do my very best to answer your question as, um, uh, uh, as good as I can um, um, with that being said. Um, so the resistance exercise protocol that we have here. Um, so let me start with the with the in and exclusion criteria. Um, we we focus this intervention on colon cancer patients with chemotherapy, and that's pretty much it. They have to be. We will assess their physical activity readiness, so they have to be interested in even doing something regarding exercise during chemotherapy. Because if not, then yeah, well then they will not really um, uh, do what we ask them to do. Um, but they don't have to need to have any, uh, we're not testing. Uh, the intervention is not based on whether they already have a certain fitness mm -hmm. or not. Um, far from that, we want to include everybody and not only people who already are pretty fit because then there's not much to improve. Sure. Um, and uh, the resistance exercise protocol is um, a really strict and rigid, um, and um, 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 it, but it will be looking into what is the starting point of the uh, of the patient, and then building up um, from there through uh, chemotherapy. Throughout uh, chemotherapy, we hope to progress people um, in the. Um, uh, in a way that is possible during chemotherapy. So there's five exercises mm -hmm. um, that uh, patients will be prescribed. Um, 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 and I cannot recall all five by heart. Right. Um, but they're really focused on the main muscle groups. Um, um, and there is a really rigid exercise program there that was um, defined by the, by the, by the group. Um, to make sure um, that everybody is doing this, uh, that although patients are different and everybody has their uh, different starting point, that the intervention that we're prescribing for people is still the same. Mm -hmm. And we'll be, since it is a multi-site study that will be run here and at Kaiser and at Dana-Farber, that it doesn't matter where you are random, uh, randomized, you will always be prescribed the same um, uh, exercise protocol. Okay, and it's one to one. It isn't group work. Yeah, it's one to one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So 
during the um, so the exercise trainer will meet with the participants when they're coming in for a chemotherapy infusion um, and um, um, and and will explain the exercises and pr will provide exercise materials to the participants. Um, and then they're, at, they're asked to do um, two um, training sessions per week um, throughout the whole chemotherapy, um, um, throughout the whole, whole period of chemotherapy. Okay. And uh, with respect to diet, you mentioned that there is a protein supplement. Mm -hmm. um, so is the aim of that to ensure that everybody has a, a minimum amount of protein irrespective of what their dietary intake is from food? Yeah, we had a lot of discussion about <laughs> that, um, on how exactly to do that. Um, and um, But we want to make sure that indeed patients have a sufficient amount of, of protein so that their intake level is, I think that we said we wanted to go for 1.2 or 1.4 gram per kilogram for everybody. Um, 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 but also not go too high there. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, so therefore, well, we first talked about giving them dietary recommendations on what to eat, but um, in the end we decided that it would be way easier to just provide them with a protein supplement. So they will be provided with a whey protein supplement. Okay. And have you, did you do a feasibility trial before you went into the main trial or? Yes. Yeah. 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 So there is still a feasibility trial ongoing here, but also at the other three uh, sites. And um, yeah, so far, well, the feasibility trial that we have here now in Katie Schmidt's group, um, in that group, people are really enthusiastic about exercising during chemotherapy. Um, but I have to say, there it's a it's a one group. So everybody gets the intervention. Everybody, um, uh, so it's really showing the feasibility of doing exercise during chemotherapy, yeah. um, and that sh is shown to be really, really feasible, really accepted by um, 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 by patients. But obviously, in, in the in the fourth trial, people can either be randomized to the intervention yeah. or the control group, and you never know how that will affect response. Yeah. And did I hear you say it was a waitlist control? So at the yeah. end, everybody. Yeah, at the end, people yeah. will be subscribed with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. it's so exciting! I think it's I think it's a really good uh, really good study, and I hope that we might see some of the feasibility results presented at our Isbin Park conference, which would be great. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, well, so that is not well. The, the fourth trial, obviously, is not my trial. Um, but the feasibility trial is, is Katie Smith's trial. So I'll, I'll ask her uh, about that. Yeah, that, that's great. Well, that's all the questions from me. So I'll hand you back to Erica to, to wind up. Well, I think that, you know, we've done such a perfect job timing um, this that um, we were encouraged very strongly to try to stick to the hour. So I'm going to pass straight back to Christina for, um, for a wrap up. But um, I'll just add my thanks. Um, no, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Renata, for a, a wonderful uh, webinar and um, to our uh, panelists and attendees for its uh, great discussion and uh, the questions that you asked. And um, I guess that's going to be it for now. Oh, I um, just want to remind you that this uh, webinar has been, um, has been recorded and that you can find the um, a link to the YouTube video for it um, on the website. Thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs>